Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this Public Interest Technology University Network webinar. In this case, building a cybersecurity clinic. Today, we will look at MIT's student-based cybersecurity clinic, which is a grantee from our network challenge in 2019 and 2020. We hope that the conversation today can help our viewers test and build out public interest clinics in their campuses engage local and regional organizations as the clients and hopefully identify best practices in their clinical education model. This is something that's really important for us at the Public Interest Technology University Network at New America. And as we continue to grow the field, we're more than happy to share these successes with you all. Before I introduce our panelists, just let me again remind you that you can drop questions in the Q&A and the chat, and we will be actively monitoring them. We want to hear from you as much as you can, so please keep the questions going. So just quickly to get us started, I'm going to introduce Larry Suskind from, from MIT. He's a Ford Professor of Urban and Environmental Planning. And I'm also going to introduce uh, Zhang Wu Chun, which is a, he is a PhD student in public policy and planning at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. And lastly, Avital Baral, who is a, a Master of Engineering student in computer science at MIT. They will talk a, a, about how, what is the MIT cybersecurity clinic, the EDX course that they develop and partnering with other schools. We're going to talk about that for a couple of minutes. Then we're going to talk about working with clients, in this case, municipalities and hospitals and this whole student experience. And lastly, we have, uh, we have our last version, which is uh, the clinics work with one of their partners, which is Mass Cyber Center on, on creating a minimum baseline of cybersecurity for municipalities, where we're going to be joined by uh, Stephanie Helm from uh, the director at Mass Cyber Center, Mass Tech. With, uh, without further ado, Larry, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, I, we're very uh, grateful for the support from the network. And uh, we've had a chance now to run our MIT cybersecurity clinic uh, several semesters, so we have some experience uh, to report on. And while we're uh, sure that other universities, uh, colleges will uh, go in their own direction and if they want to do work on cybersecurity and work with cities and towns and states, uh, we want to share with you what we've learned so far. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, one more, thank you. So um, we run a clinic, which is a course. It's a semester long course. And uh, all the students from all over the campus who are invited to enroll in the, in, this, in the clinic begin by taking four one week modules that are pre-prepared and are online. So each week, the student works uh, three, four hours uh, on a module uh, on their own time. But at the end of that week on Friday, the class meets and we talk about the experience of the module the students had that week. And we do the same thing for four weeks. And at the end of the four weeks, uh, the students take an exam, a uh, multiple choice exam. And um, so far, there hasn't been a student who hasn't passed it because they've paid attention and uh, done the work necessary. Uh, but it's very important that students pass this exam because the next thing that happens is that they join in teams and the teams work for public agency or hospital clients for the remainder of the semester for let's say eight weeks. And I wanna be able to say as the uh, head of the clinic, uh, look, you're getting students who are prepared to do this work. They can come and help you over eight weeks prepare a vulnerability assessment so your agency or your hospital will be able to anticipate the kinds of uh, attacks that might uh, be aimed at you by hackers in the world at large. And we can help you think about the things you have to do to reduce your risk or your vulnerability. And I want to be able to say, 
to uh, city agencies when we sign them up as clients, don't worry, you're going to get students who are prepared to do this work for you. They've taken an exam at the end of the four weeks. Um, it's true that the four week course is also an edX course that anyone anywhere in the world can take for free. And uh, you'll see in the chat some link where you can look at uh, that edX course and anyone can take it. And any university could have its students start or prepare ahead of time by taking this course before students go to work for public agencies or in our case, also for hospitals. Um, we have both undergraduates and graduates together in the class and the teams, each team has undergraduates and graduates. Uh, nobody's required to be a computer science major because we are looking at what we call defensive social engineering moves that cities and hospitals can make to reduce their vulnerability to attack. Um, we use very specific templates and tools that students learn about during those four weeks, and then they apply them in working as a team with an agency. And we have a memorandum of understanding, a kind of contract with each public entity that a team is working for. We don't charge the public agencies for the work, but we have a contract and it guarantees that we will keep confidential any and all uh, materials and insights generated during the semester. Uh, next slide, please. So the clinic um, starts with this material that students learn on their own, and then we meet to talk about, and then they work in teams. Now, during the time they're working in teams, we also meet every week, and each team gets to talk about the problems they're having, executing each step in the process of preparing a vulnerability assessment. They need to gather information. So we have question asking tools and formats. And then when the information comes in, they have to begin to imagine what the answers to the questions are from the information that's come in. And with that information, they prepare a draft assessment using a format that is the same in every case. And they give that to the client. The client says, oh, wait a minute. Oh no, who did you talk to? How did you get that? And we work with them because we only want to give them a document at the end that the client is going to find useful within the city or amongst their staff. And so we have a process of reviewing the draft assessment, their comments on it, and producing a final assessment, which only goes to the client. We won't answer questions from the newspaper, from the media, nothing. We only trying to be useful to the client. And um, there's 17 questions in a format that have to be answered for us to produce what we think is an adequate draft assessment and then final assessment. All of those questions for anybody in the cybersecurity field come from what is called the NIST, N-I-S-T, larger framework which is used in the United States and elsewhere as well. And uh, we've boiled it down to these 17 questions, uh, which ask, what did you, what have you done to prepare? If you've had attacks, what have you done during and what will you do during an attack? And then what's your plan for how you're going to make sense of what happened after an attack? And the NIST framework that we work with has this before, during, after framework, which carries over into our 17 questions. Uh, when we started adding hospitals this uh, semester, uh, we had to augment the question asking process. And Rebecca Spirak, who you'll meet in a few moments, uh, is a student uh, who has helped us from her own professional experience uh, develop a further version of our question asking process so that we can work for hospitals as well because they have a variety of additional things to worry about. So that's the general frame. Next slide, please. Um, the the four week course has a lot of background that students need to prepare. And so we explain to them what others have done research about and we summarize research and we um, 
run certain hypotheticals uh, in the material in the edX course and the four modules, and we get people to understand what critical urban infrastructure is, why it's vulnerable, who are the attackers, what are the lines of attack, what has the federal government been doing, although our focus is more on state and local government. Um, then in the second module, in the second week, uh, students see examples of ways of communicating with the potential client. In fact, they see video of other students communicating the request for information well and badly. And they see what happens in those two different versions of trying to get information from the client. And then we have, require students to interview other people besides the client contact uh, to fill in certain background to understand the context. And again, there's video of students talking with others in the city or in other agencies that the city might work with. And when that goes well, they see what that looks like. And when it goes badly, they see what that looks like. And then in the final segment of the preparatory edX course, they see a team of students trying to prepare a vulnerability assessment and what happens when you present that to the client. So there's lots of background reading and material all summarized uh, in these uh, uh, short video uh, components. And then there are self tests that students can do to make sure they're learning what's necessary so that when the final exam comes up at the end, there is no problem. Everybody has been able to pass that. Um, I think there's a, one more slide or not. Um, yeah, so the point of the clinic is both to prepare students for a career or work in cybersecurity, particularly in the public sector or in the not-for-profit world. Um, we also trying to provide a service at the same time, which we believe universities have an obligation to do. So the direct client interaction becomes the clinical learning opportunity for students. Um, we believe that it's possible to systematize the question asking that goes into reducing a city agency's vulnerability to cyber attack, but the specifics, is it a transportation agency, is it a health agency, the students might know something about the substantive area because of what they're studying, or they might not. We try to make the team, depending on which students are in the class, uh, include students with different backgrounds. They may be from the urban planning field, they may be from the computer science field, they may be from the management field. We try to have a student team that knows something about the substantive questions that the agency works on, but really the most important thing is that they're, they're learning what are the problems of trying to help a public agency anticipate cyber attacks and do things organizationally that mean that they reduce their risks? And the kinds of risks that we focus on have more to do with what people do than they do have to do with the failure of hardware or software. Yes, we have lots of computer science background amongst the students on the team, but the questions are about what happens when people in a public agency haven't been trained to take cybersecurity seriously and they open an untrusted email attachment and that releases malware. The malware releases ransomware all the data of the agency is encrypted. Now they have to decide whether they're going to negotiate with terrorists, pay a ransom or not. And we show them what they should have done before that moment comes. Because if you don't have backups of your most important data, the problem of deciding what to do is way harder than if you already imagined what could happen and you have system of backups, you have a clear understanding of the risks you face. So this is what we mean by defensive social engineering. That's the orientation that we take 
uh, in the courts. Uh, defensive social engineering, even though people have lots of technical background, we're saying that the big risks have to do with what the least educated and prepared person in an agency does or doesn't do at a critical moment. And if there hasn't been proper training internally, if they haven't thought about what they're going to do when and if there's an attack, if they haven't clarified who has responsibility to take action when and if there's an attack, it's too late when there's an attack. And so we try to help our clients by asking questions and then giving them feedback on their answers compared to what best practice looks like to us. And when we discovered that we were lucky in Massachusetts, where MIT is, that we have a state agencies that thought about all this way before we did, and it's been working, and you'll hear more about this from Stephanie Helm before we're done today. The state's been thinking about what should cities and towns do at a minimum to prepare to deal with uh, cyber attack. And we've been trying to learn from and work with Stephanie and uh, Mass Cyber. And we're actually now spinning off some research for them so that students at MIT who work with the clinic can then also develop research activities of their own. Uh, Avital, who you're going to meet and have met, is writing a thesis uh, on uh, some of the material. I'll let her talk about it in a minute. Um, but the clinic is a focal point for teaching, training, and service. And it then is a launch pad for students on the MIT campus to spin off other research activities with faculty. And yes, there are some other courses on the campus. Uh, there are lots of technical courses on uh, cybersecurity in the uh, com oper uh, computer science department. Um, and the Sloan School gives courses on cybersecurity in the corporate context, but we're the focus for a, a clinic that prepares people to work on cybersecurity. Uh, a question came in asking about my background. I do not have a computer science background. Uh, I'm lucky I have terrific students like the ones you're going to meet in a moment uh, who know way more than I do. Um, I got into this in the beginning because one of my doctoral students was very heavily into this field and he wanted to move from the uh, computer science side more to the defensive social engineering side. And since I study the way in which public agencies and organizations make decisions, how they think about risk, how they manage risk. Uh, I work on climate change, that's a risk. Uh, I needed to learn a lot uh, from my students and from other faculty who I brought in to help to develop the online segments of this course. So when you look at the edX course, you'll see other faculty from the uh, computer science side at MIT. Um, but no, this doesn't require a faculty member, in my view, from computer science to be the lead in the cybersecurity clinic. You could do it that way, but in the model we've adopted, because of my limitations, uh, we've done it in this particular way. Uh, let me stop there um, and uh, maybe pass things along um, to, uh, I guess, Jung or Rebecca or Avi, I'm not sure which of you want to start talking about what it's like working with clients? I can uh, take that. Oh, go ahead. Yes, please, Avital. And um, to all of the other viewers, I'm looking at your, uh, at your questions and uh, we'll get to them at, at the end of the, of the webinar. Avital, all yours. Uh, yeah, thank you. If we could move on to the next slide. Thanks. So we're, uh, Rebecca and I are going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, who our clients have been in the context of this clinic course and sort of the main takeaways that we've gotten from working with those clients. So um, we've mostly been working or a part of the clinic is working with municipalities within the New England area, which is our uh, regional area as we're based out of MIT, uh, with a particular focus on uh, the areas of greatest risk within those municipalities, which are often critical infrastructure and essential public services. So things like, you know, um, fish bath systems for um, the fire department or payroll systems or other systems like that that are, provide essential services and are often left uh, unguarded or not sufficiently well guarded. 
And then our goal, as um, Professor Susskind talked about, is to support municipalities in achieving, um, you know, in making themselves sort of not the lowest hanging fruit in terms of being vulnerable to uh, cyber security, to uh, cyber attacks. And we do this through um, this vulnerability assessment process, which as we've uh, discussed before, is not so much based on specific you know, hardware or software or penetration testing or sort of that sort of thing, but rather examining processes and organizational structures that ensure um, that everyone has a baseline of understanding about cybersecurity and about what to do uh, in order to not make themselves as much of a target. And then in addition, we sort of want to balance the security needs of these organizations with the known constraints that they face in terms of resources, because municipalities, especially smaller municipalities, often have very limited budget, very limited staff. Uh, so if we suggest, you know, expensive solutions that are expensive in terms of time or in terms of money or both, you know, we don't necessarily think that that will be followed through. So we want to provide uh, not quick fixes, but, you know, things that are, uh, you know, process changes or organizational changes that would make a real difference in, sort of, in terms of their cybersecurity readiness rather than jumping directly to, you know, like really expensive uh, processes. So um, that said, I want to introduce Rebecca, uh, who's going to speak next. Rebecca is a graduate student at MIT who has also worked as part of the clinic and has led our uh, move into working with healthcare delivery organizations such as hospitals and expanding the clinic's work in that area. And she has a bunch to say about that process. So I'm just going to hand it over to her. Thanks, Avi, really appreciate it. Um, so a lot of the um, expansion into healthcare delivery organizations, hospitals, clinics, um, it builds very neatly off of working with municipalities. There was, I think, a surprising amount of similarities considering hospitals are for-profit, municipalities are not, although that is obviously a key difference. Um, but there are a couple of areas that are significantly different that we had to pay attention to when creating a questionnaire or working with our clients. The first is the area of greatest risk, right? So hospitals themselves, healthcare is considered um, critical infrastructure based on um, CISA's designation of the 16 critical sectors, um, so which is great, but um, there's a particular piece here, which is patient safety, right? That if something actually ends up happening in the, over the course um, uh, uh, to a hospital, for example, a patient's not able to get the critical, you know, life-saving care that they potentially need. So we had to keep that in mind when we talked with our, um, you know, healthcare clients to say, have you actually thought about what would happen in X, Y, and Z circumstance, given how important the services are. Um, the other really different piece is um, the nature of the sensitive information. Um, I know many folks um, are familiar with HIPAA, right? Um, as well as um, just in general, right? That your healthcare information is something that is private to you. Um, and that comes with extra security controls and risks that um, a hospital would need to follow. So as an example, when we were working with our clients, there were sometimes a little bit of back and forth on, oh, you know, we set up things given our limited resources, right? Some of the things that Avi just spoke about, um, but we accidentally, right, put data together that shouldn't have been put together, right? And it was potentially an easy fix of conversation. So it's those sorts of things that we're trying to kind of uncover. Um, and the last thing, which is more of a trend. So if you're setting up your own clinic and you're looking at, um, you know, just general sort of technology trends, this is more, uh, this is us basically introducing something that is definitely on the horizon for many hospitals, which is the internet of things, in this case, medical devices, but, you know, it might affect whatever sort of clinic you decide to set up. And in this case, it increases your attack service, meaning you have more things connected to the internet, there's more of a chance for um, someone to use that to launch an attack, get into an environment or move within you know, a hospital's network. And that was a very interesting conversation. Um, in our experiences, we didn't find that it was widely applicable yet because a lot of hospitals haven't necessarily fully converted into buying internet connected devices, but it's good to start having the conversation early and think about it from a prevention standpoint rather than in uh, retroactive cleanup. So that was a very, um, sort of interesting piece of working with hospitals as well. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so we're gonna, we also like to go through a little bit of the themes that Avi and I have experienced both as students and as TAs working, working with clients. Um, Avi, you wanna kick this off? Yeah, so the first thing is uh, somewhat of a hopeful thing. 
uh, which is that we see a really sincere desire to improve security and to take security seriously, at least in all the clients that we have worked with. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, municipalities out there and a lot of folks working in those municipalities who feel really strongly about their job and who really want to make sure that they're doing the right thing, but find themselves, you know, unable to do so sometimes, partly due to a lack of information and partly to, due to a lack of resources. And something that we have found, uh, feedback we've received from clients that has been really heartening in the context of viewing this clinic as a uh, mechanism for service from the university to its um, sort of regional area is that providing them with this vulnerability assessment, both highlighting the things that are lacking, but in particular highlighting the things that they may be already doing well, is something that is really helpful for IT directors and other people who find themselves responsible for cybersecurity to go and you know, argue with their, uh, you know, at the municipal budget meeting or in the places where um, resources are decided and to point to these, this, ass this assessment and say something like, well, you know, we're, we're doing this thing right, uh, but we're also looking to make improvements in these set of areas. And here's someone external to us who is like pointing these things for us. So we think of this, uh, this service that we're doing in terms of providing this assessment from a third party that can help change things uh, within inside of the organization. Yeah, and to kind of um, pick up from there, um, something that was you know, previously alluded to um, on the sort of client engagement slides is for anyone obviously who's starting starting a clinic, a lot of this, even though we're talking about technology, has a lot to do with people and process, right? There are things that have to do with accountability, um, roles and responsibilities, knowing who's in charge of what at what time and understanding the way things work from a process perspective, even though our brains normally think, oh, it's a tech fix. I think it's a really important point um, when um, you know engaging and starting and, and starting a clinic, that it's it's often uh, the people element, not necessarily the tech, that will um, you know end up moving things forward. Uh, another important theme that we did um, discover over the course of working at the clinic was folks had trouble defining their area of greatest risk. And in, in your clinic, it might be the areas of greatest priority, but in, in this case, you know, because of cybersecurity, we call it, call it risk. And a lot of folks even though they're working in a city or hospital, they didn't think about the difference between a water treatment facility, right? And, um, you know, their IT infrastructure. So um, it was a really interesting conversation. And again, it's just bringing something up and having the conversation because no one had asked the question before. Um, we also found that a lot of folks, they did have plans, right? They did actually think about these things um, pretty in depth, but they never tested them. Right, and being able to say it's really important in cybersecurity to have a tabletop exercise, but again, just in general, to actually go through and test all the hard work that you've done, so you could see it actually works, whether with data backups or you know doing a, a, a simulation. Um, it was it was really um, eye opening for some folks. And the other thing, which I know many folks have seen in the news, is that um, the accountability between those within the organization, municipality or hospital and those who sit outside of it um, was also very vague, right? So who's accountable in, um, in the event of an attack? Where does my data go, right? Some sort of basic questions because most folks just think about their own organization and they don't necessarily think about interaction out, outside of it. So that was an important piece that we did, a uh, key thing we did see. Um, the, the last piece is we really wanted to, we realized that there's a lot of low hanging fruit to kind of move further research and engagement forward, right? So. One of them was that roles and responsibilities piece, making sure people know um, what they're, you know, basically documenting down what they're supposed to be doing at what time, knowing how they engage with stakeholders. Um, we have an example where um, the hospital, one of the hospitals that we worked with, they thought that their vendor patched the servers and their vendor thought that they patched the servers, right? So all it took was a conversation for something very, very easy, very low hanging fruit, but no, it was just assumptions that ended up putting them at greater risk. So we had a lot of impact there. Um, and then the, the sort of last piece, which I think is a good transition, is even though having these conversations and these engagements is very important, there are these resources that um, would be able to move things forward um, and allow uh, municipalities and hospitals to be able to work on their own so that things live on after we're gone. Right. And one of those things that we found was having clear implementable security standards. So I'm going to pass it off to Jung, um, who's going to um, talk a, a bit about some of the standard of care work that, that he's been involved in. 
Yep. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm Jung Wu. I work with Professor Larry Suskind on um, various things, including um, running the cybersecurity clinic um, the last year or so. Um, and I think um, going back to the point about the clinic being the focal point for teaching, training, and service, um, I found it really fascinating how different research topics emerged from the clinic. Um, and one of this, these topics um, is the standard of care, as Rebecca mentioned previously. Um, so in addition to helping municipalities and hospitals, um, the clinic aims to expand the outreach by doing more in-depth research on these topics that come out of the vulnerability assessments, what they feel vulnerable, um, the gaps, the holes that we find, uh, the things they, they might be able to implement right away, but may not be able to. Um, so we, had, we started a discussion on the importance of standard of care for municipalities and healthcare systems, whether municipalities and um, local agencies should have a certain level of cybersecurity standard in place. Um, so we, we hope to spell out um, the minimum cybersecurity protections that should be expected from these entities, um, you know, such that of, of training, whether employees um, in the city uh, in the city are required to take uh, certain, you know, basic measures um, uh, such as training on phishing or other common risk factors, um, or whether there is a predefined incident response plan, um, knowing who has the authority to shut down the system when there's an attack. Um, who has access to critical systems and who, you know, who to report to during an attack. All of those things, I think, fall under um, the, what we believe as the minimum. And um, the clinic has established partnerships with state and local agencies, including um, the Mass, uh, Mass Cyber Center um, and uh, the Massachusetts Municipal Association. And, and without these organizations, uh, I think the clinic wouldn't have come so far. They've been great advocates uh, for the clinic, um, not only to help advertise the clinic's availability to potential clients, uh, cities and towns in New England, um, but also work with us as collaborators um, and in the research areas like the stand of care. So the clinic partners with the Mass Cyber Center and the Cyber Resilient Massachusetts Working Group on refining the minimum baseline of cybersecurity for municipalities uh, that they developed. Um, so uh, the Mass Cyber Center and the working group uh, released a municipal cybersecurity toolkit in um, October, 2019 to help municipal leaders assess the cybersecurity posture of their municipality and figure out next steps for protecting their municipal infrastructure against cyber threats. Um, so I think we can move on to the next slide, and we are very pri privileged to have Stephanie Helm with us today, uh, who leads Mass Cyber Center. So I'll turn it over to Stephanie to talk about uh, um, the Mass Cyber Center, the working group, and how the work with the clinic came about. Well, thank you, Jungwoo, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, this is a really valuable partnership in the work that we're doing. Um, the Mass Cyber Center was established in 2017. I came on board in 2018 and we um, created the Cyber Resilient Massachusetts Working Group um, meets monthly. Uh, it includes state agencies, representatives from some of the local governments, as well as some representatives from private industry um, with the goal of trying to improve the collaboration on resiliency, as well as the planning efforts for the state. So um, one of the topics that came to the top of the heap early on was the challenges facing municipalities. Uh, Massachusetts has 351 cities and towns. There's no overarching county government as there is in some other states. So there's no uh, structure that um, sort of put consolidates folks within regions. That's all 351 different standards of uh, resources available to them um, and different IT architectures. So therefore each city and town is sort of uniquely facing a cybersecurity challenge. So we kind of embarked on how did we, how to get a better handle on how we can be helpful to the municipalities in the state. I think the first thing that we did was uh, 
created a sub working group that was really focused on municipalities and um, um, really tried to engage them at, you know, try to understand what their problem um, is in trying to improve cybersecurity. The uh, next thing that we did was we um, partnered with the Massachusetts Municipal Association to conduct a survey of municipalities. Um, we took about 12 to 15 questions just so that we could get sort of a sense of what the shortfalls were from their perspective and what they thought might be useful. Um, and one of the things that came out of that survey was the pointing to the fact that um, probably about 10% that answered the survey had an incident response plan. So that meant, you know, probably about 90% did not have a, a plan. And to me, that was sort of like a good way to start because if you uh, understand the planning process, you know that you um, um, will have to create a team and you have to um, ensure that you aren't using the same language and you have some documentation involved. So we felt like the planning would be the um, first step. And so we've um, wanted to create uh, tools for the uh, municipalities to be able to use in order to um, support their cybersecurity efforts. Um, Jung Woo mentioned that we created an online municipal cybersecurity toolkit. Uh, that toolkit was a place where we could post resources that um, would be able to point um, cities and towns into the right direction. But it really was sort of a whole listing of things that they could do, um, particularly with regard to ransomware or um, other things that might be relevant to um, cybersecurity for the municipalities. Uh, so this sub working group actually came up with the idea of creating the four goal areas um, that would be the aspiration for every municipality to be able to say that yes, um, in these four goal areas, we have something for our town that could provide what we would call the foundation or the minimum baseline. Uh, the four goal areas are an employee training program, a threat sharing program of some sort, um, a cyber incident response plan. And then the fourth area was general best practices such as um, managing passwords or improving your architecture for some, for some way. But, it would, be a, it would be the four goal areas that a town could at least internally do their own assessment that says, do I have an employee training program, yes or no? If I'm yes, then I've met the minimum. If I'm no, I haven't even got to the foundation. And so that's kind of the approach that we're using. Um, and we were very delighted to um, have the clinic partner along with us as, as we were embarking on trying to um, raise awareness for this uh, minimum baseline of cybersecurity and hopefully improve it. Um, the clinic was already individually engaging with um, one or two or three municipalities during the course of a, of, a, of a school semester. This would allow the clinic to kind of broadly help us statewide improve this program and also to be able to see where is it that municipalities are finding the most difficult time in meeting some of those goals. So I don't know if that gives you the overview that you were looking for, Jung Woo. No, oh, that, was, that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think we can turn it over to Avi, uh, give us a little update on our progress so far in working with Mass Cyber Center and, um, and we're hoping to expect more results in the summer. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jung. So uh, I, along with uh, some other student graduate students at MIT, have been working on continuing uh, this research project. In particular, the, the research question we're asking is how can um, the state and my cyber center in particular help at-risk municipalities reach a minimum baseline of cybersecurity? And so we've, um, we've come up with a sample of Massachusetts municipalities uh, broken up by region of Massachusetts as well as uh, city and town sizes, so we can get some really small towns and some, some bigger towns as well. And we've been asking them questions around their current progress uh, towards the minimum baseline, the sorts of challenges that they face, 
And in particular, what resources and or interventions from the state would be helpful and how uh, the current resources in the toolkit measure up to their needs. So we've only we've just gotten started with this process and we've, uh, we don't have too big of a sample size yet. We're expecting more results by the end of the summer. But preliminarily, just uh, based as, as the person who's been uh, conducting this research, I think we see a need for more intermunicipal cooperation. As Stephanie mentioned, uh, we don't have a, a county you know, structure that would allow especially some of these smaller municipalities to really like pull together their resources and their knowledge around this issue. And so a lot of them uh, feel feel kind of lost in that they say, well, you know, I want to do the right thing. You know, I know that I need to have employee training or I know that I need to, uh, you know, make sure that my uh, that my uh, all of my employees like know what to do in the event that they get an email that, uh, you know, looks like a phishing email. Uh, but the the way that they like figure out what to do seems a bit ad hoc in that they will uh, ask people that they know, often like other people in IT roles at other municipalities and say like, hey, like what vendor are you using for this? Or how are you handling you know, this problem? And so we definitely see a need for a more centralized like source of information about this and you know, perhaps like in-person or, or Zoom meetings uh, between these different people who are in similar positions and find themselves like solving the same problem, but they don't know that each of them is solving mm. a similar problem. So that's sort of our very preliminary results, but we're hoping as, as we're, we're continuing this research and talking with more folks, we're, we'll have some more actionables that we'll put into some sort of report uh, that will you know, evaluate a little bit of the state of this issue and the progress towards the minimum baseline, as well as uh, resources that the cities, the, the cities and towns themselves uh, have told us that they would like and that they need. If I could add on, Abby, um, I, I think it's an important point to, to say it's nice to have a third party who's a neutral in this whole process asking the questions because you, you tend to set up the expectation like if the state is asking, what, what do you need? The answer is always going to be more money, more people. Okay, well, I, I don't know that there's a one size fits all that we can do for every single municipality. So it's kind of nice to be able to try to get below that request for send me more people, more money, and try to get more deeply into the, into the issues without that expectation that you're gonna be able to deliver on it. Um, that I think is very helpful because then we can take all that body of work back and then we can kind of correlate to see what that is that might be most helpful. And then another point that Avi brought up that I think is valid and we've kind of recognized it at the center, um, very much when we, um, we, at the Mass Cyber Center, we actually did have a contract to put on workshops for um, incident response planning. Um, and we didn't run it as one big workshop for the state. We did it in, in the Homeland Security regions. So we broke it up into the five regions with the hope that people who attended the workshop would meet their neighboring towns or cities and, and start to come together physically um, with a kind of a regional geographic connection. The problem was the pandemic hit and those workshops ended up being virtual. Uh, the good news is we got the products and so you'll see the products in the, um, the templates and the um, other information are on the website, uh, but we, we did hear back from the people that participated that they were looking forward to doing something more regionally focused. So we've been working within the working group, working in the working group um, with the Executive Office of Technology Services and Security to see if we can facilitate um, connections regionally and have IT working groups that are regionally focused with the outcome hopefully of those local working groups building trust and relationships uh, amongst themselves. And then that also allows us to have a better communication methodology um, where if, if something is a happening in one particular uh, municipality, we can alert people locally or we can at least get information from them to share with other working groups. We're adding that. Yeah, and I'll add that broadly speaking, we find that um, you know, the people that we've been talking with so far I, are quite savvy and definitely think that this is, you know, an important issue and that often they're the person who is advocating uh, for, you know, more resources, more work on cybersecurity in their own organization. Um, so I think that's really encouraging to see.
Yep. Uh, I, yep. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say to uh, Alberto, um, I'm eager to respond to yes. questions that have been raised and uh, the terrific questions, a lot of them about nuts and bolts, a lot of them are about sort of philosophy or pedagogy, uh, but you, you, are you going to be the master of ceremonies? For this? Yes, right now. I've been, I've been actually going through the, for all the questions. We have a lot of questions regarding um, security issues with and how are you protecting for them. So I'm going to start with that okay. uh, and then I'm going to cycle through and please, I will direct the question at someone, uh, some of you, but feel free to pass it along to someone else. And so the first one that, that I'm actually going to bring is, is the last one that we heard from Bo Yuan. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, so he says that when engaging with clients, it is possible for students to make mistakes. So is there any legal protections for students? Um, and I'm actually joining that question with another one and talking, a, a, so you, you can talk to us a little bit about that. Do you sign an NDA or is it just verbal commitment? I, I heard that you do a memorandum of understanding. So can you walk us a little bit of, on, on, on that process? And I think Larry. Yeah. Uh, so I started uh, with a conversation with the MIT general counsel. When we got the grant and we wanted to design the clinic, um, I said, if students are gonna be working for cities and towns and hospitals, uh, what liability do students have? What liability do the faculty have? What liability does MIT have? How should we handle that? Uh, the first point that, then this is MIT's response. I have no idea uh, what another university might say. MIT says, uh, students sign nothing. Uh, I cannot ask students to sign anything uh, in terms of working with the client that that I as the faculty member teaching the course, which is a course for credit, uh, I have to sign the uh, uh, the memorandum of understanding with the client. The client is typically a city or a hospital. It's a, the CEO or the COO of the hospital. It's the head of an agency or the someone asked uh, it, do, what is the reaction of the CISO, the, the chief information security officer in the places that we work? The answer is they don't have one in the most of the places that we work. They have an IT guy who's been saddled with cybersecurity in smaller places, even in some larger cities, it's the IT office that's been given this responsibility. And so either it's the deputy mayor or the, the head of the IT office that we sign an agreement with. And the agreement says, we will produce a draft assessment. We will send the draft to the client. Based on their responses, we will submit a final assessment. The assessment will include a review of the answers, yes or no, do you meet the, what we would argue minimum standard on each of these 17 areas? If no, why no? And what do we suggest are things that they should do? We are not gonna take those next steps and do the things. So a question from NIST in our outline of questions, and yes, we're happy to share the document with the list of questions and the question asking templates, everything. We're happy to share all of it with everybody. And Jung will say something about how we make that available to you. Um, but the question would be, uh, do you inventory all of your computer systems, all of your information systems? Uh, yes or no? Do you have an inventory of them? Do you check that inventory? If there are things that need to be, as you heard from Rebecca, things that need to be patched or repaired, do, who does that? Do you do that regularly? Um, do you have training for your staff, not just when they're newly hired, but continuing training? Do you have an, a, an incident response plan? Have you tested it? Do you have cyber insurance? What is that insurance policy? What does it cover? Do you know what it covers or doesn't cover? Do you, have you rehearsed the implementation of your incident response plan? Yes or no? Have you been attacked? Yes or no? What did you do when you were attacked? What have you learned and changed as the basis of that attack? These are the kinds of questions that students are asking. They're not just asking the client, but all of the staff and all of the related agency staff 
that you need to ask the questions of to be able to come up with an answer. And then in the draft assessment that students provide, we give our answer, our reasons why, and there's a section with suggestions for things they should do. Um, every student on every team has some responsibility, but it is student team that prepares the draft assessment. Every draft assessment is reviewed by all of the students and the faculty along the way. In the end, the assessment draft I, it could have a, a, a mistake in it in that we should have checked no because we should have interviewed somebody else, but they're telling us who we should interview. We're doing the interviews. We're summarizing what they say. Based on what they say, we're checking yes, no, spelling out why, and making recommendations. Um, if they get the draft from us and they say, we don't think you should check no in this category, we'll say, well, here are the reasons we said that, which, what's wrong? They said, no, no, it's just not good for us to have a report that checks no here. We say, well, um, we want this to be useful to you. Uh, we can check uh, not clear. We can say, we don't know if this is yes or no, because we thought it was no, but uh, you've given us some reasons to be concerned about that. We'll give you that in the document, but we're not going to change it and say something we don't think is true. Um, we could be misled by not doing enough interviews. We could have misinterpreted maybe different things that different people said and drew a wrong conclusion. But in general, it is the, there's no individual student responsible for the draft and the final draft has gone through the client. So MIT says um, the, the, the statement that we sign at the beginning needs to say, here's exactly what will happen. Here's exactly what we'll do. Uh, MIT is not going to make any corrections for you in your systems. And it's not going to draw any final conclusions for you about your systems. You're going to have to do that. So. Uh, MIT General Counsel said, well, you, Larry, can sign this and say that's what we're going to do. And that's what it says in the Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, and there's no money changing hands. And there's nobody that report goes to except to the client. And if we use it for research, we scrub any reference to the actual place. And then we use the data in our uh, analysis. So MIT felt there was no liability for the students. They said they felt that I could sign that for my as myself as the person teaching it. I file that memorandum of understanding with my department. But thus far, uh, that's been the process. There haven't been any issues. I don't think there's any liability yeah. because we are not physically changing anything in the place. We are giving suggestions and our reasons why, and all the decisions are up to them. Thank you for that, Larry. Um, again, this is this is just one case, and, and uh, here at the, uh, the public university, uh, public interest technology university, never would want to to uh, to push it to to create more spaces like like MIT has done. So I'm more than happy to connect you uh, with Larry and and go over those documents if, if that is needed. I'm gonna switch over to another question, and I think that Avital would be the Avital or Rebecca might be the, the best one. Alberto, to see. sorry. Um, before we move on to the next question, I just want to add one quick point. Um, in the we we provide a link to the online course in the chat, I believe. Um, so the the course is usually run most of the year. So the as as you've heard, the course is four weeks long. It's it's generally open for about nine to ten months. Right now, at this current state. Right now, it's currently closed, um, and it will reopen in August. And when, once you, um, it's free to join the course. So once you join the course, um, you'll see some sample forms that are provided in the course. And um, as Professor Suskind explained at the very beginning, we have various simulations um, showing students at MIT engaging with uh, client-like 
situations where um, they would go through these various processes. And, and, and one of those is signing the letter of agreement or the memorandum of understanding. And we have a sample form there that everyone can download. Um, so you can use that as kind of a, a platform to design your own um, and think about how you could use it when you create your own clinic, uh, whether it's cybersecurity or not. Um, so just want to point that out. And, and, and the course is, again, opening um, in, I think, I believe, August 20th. So you, right now, you won't see a start date, but it will begin in August, um, and it will go on for another nine or 10 months. And John Wu, uh, following up on that, uh, where can people find the NIST risk assessment and the seven questions? So, uh, Zhang, I don't know whether we could do this right now, but I have no problem um, posting uh, a link to the 17 questions, which are in a memo that um, I, I think you might have handy. Um, but also, anybody can email uh, me after this event. It's just my last name, S-U-S-S-K-I-N-D at mit.edu and say, send me this, send me that, and we will do our best to respond. The things that we have are a model of the memorandum of understanding, the questions that are going to form the basis of the assessment that are boiled down from the over 100 questions from the NIST framework down to 17. Uh, and you can see the format that we use that students fill in. Um, the survey the questions that we ask in the beginning to get the data from our clients that we then use to put the interviews together that supplement the survey that then allow us to fill out all the questions so you we're happy to share all, all of, of these materials um, we're not assuming everybody will do the same thing but it will give you a basis to start with uh, you may not want to focus on the social the defensive social engineering side of cybersecurity. Uh, you may want to not work with public agencies, but rather private agencies, in which case there are different kinds of things to be concerned about. Um, but we're happy to share all that um, material. Yeah, right. And I think a really good follow-up question uh, on that is, when you when you were creating this, what what are the most have tools, the equipment, the software that you needed to include to build the lab? And this this question comes from Hassan Zamir. Yeah, well, it's going to sound um, uh, maybe incomplete, but um, we needed to make the online courses because I needed to supplement my meager background and certain technical questions with what other faculty from other parts of MIT could help me prepare. So we produced, video produced this uh, four, four week, four module program. And um, because of the grant from the from, uh, uh, Public Interest Technology uh, program, we had the money to go to MIT and say, we're not asking you to pay for it, we're paying for it. We're producing it, and then it's going to go free on edX. So you're not going to sell it uh, after we make it. Um, once we had that training material in one place, we use it every time. Um, I don't, I don't have any other costs related. I mean, yes, there's a TA or really a partner. If Jungwoo Jung weren't here, I would have to have another person with his background, capability, and skill to help me manage the clinic because we offer this every semester. Uh, and I'll come to the question of how do you recruit new clients and who does that between semesters? Uh, but I need, I need a, 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 a very capable graduate teaching assistant and that would be different in different universities, how that's financed. Uh, my department support helps to support this because the, the clinic is a course in the department. But other than the TA, because we've been online, I haven't had to pay the cost for students to travel to a city where they might have to stay overnight for two nights. So they have to rent a car or 
stay at a, at a hotel for two nights and do 20 interviews. Now everything's been online. So there's been no cost associated with travel to places. Um, there's no other equipment. We're not doing uh, the, some of the things that uh, cybersecurity consultants would do uh, where you need various forms of various kinds of software programs to test or simulate to show a client the things that are not working in their place. And Stephanie knows more about this than I do, but we're not doing that. So the cost of this clinic is uh, my teaching time, uh, Jung's teaching time, and the preparation of the initial materials. That's it. Now, the additional research that is spun off from the clinic that we're doing with, with Stephanie, um, that's a kind of thing where you need to raise research funds, whether from inside your department or outside, but to actually do this clinic. And now what we're saying, because of the initial uh, uh, foundation support, um, this online course, any, and there are several universities around the country that are using the same first four weeks at no cost, and if they want the students to pay the hundred dollars to take the test, fine. If they don't, they don't have to. Um, but the other places don't have to invest in creating all of that teaching material. It now exists. And after that, it's faculty and graduate students to uh, supervise the student work on a weekly basis with the clients. So there, there's not other costs. There's no equipment that I know of. <laughs> I'm not using any. Uh, but that's because of the focus that we've taken. If somebody else may need to invest in uh, other specialized um, te uh, supplementary teaching or software or other programs, we don't have those costs. Jung, am I skipping anything? No, I think I think you're right. Um, we, I mean, we are exploring different ways to improve our ways of keeping the data. Uh, um, but again, that's, that's not um, a separate huge cost that we're expecting. Uh, we are able to work with the resources that MIT provides um, backed by MIT firewall and things like that. So um, no, we don't, I don't think, and I think that's because of the focus that we're taking, the social defensive engineering focus. Um, if your focus is more technical in, um, as far as, um, you know, using cer certain software for Cybersecurity per se, then um, I think that's a that's a that may that might be a different story. But yeah, that's my understanding as well. Why don't you just say one more word about what we had to do to promise our clients that we're taking good care of the data that we're collecting while we're doing the assessment? Yeah. Um, so we uh, also um, outlined those um, promises or um, the words that we would live up to uh, when it comes to keeping the data safe and storage and, and trans, uh, transit. Um, there are certain things that we, we definitely abide, abide by um, with the students um, and everything that we exchange or receive from the clients, we uh, always use Dropbox uh, with dual authentication. Um, and we, we, don't, we don't send anything in the email. We don't receive anything in the email, always goes through Dropbox. Um, and so there's a very, uh, there's always uh, this single channel of exchange of sensitive material. Uh, we absolutely are very careful about confidentiality, anonymity. Um, the report is only shared with the client, no one else. Um, the client it has co-copyright, so the client is able to um, you know, share the, the assessment with people within the city, with the leadership in the city, but it doesn't go out of the clinic um, or uh, uh, the, the client can decide to use the report um, in the way that they want to, but it doesn't go out of the clinic uh, with our discretion. So um, I think that pretty much covers everything. Although if I'm missing anything, please feel free to add. Thank you, John Wu. Um, so here's another question and it's, it's changing a little bit of the topic, but um, how are clinic and, and clinics and assessment received by those public institutions? Larry, you already uh, talked about this a little bit about how chief information security officers and well, sometimes that, that there are no chief information security officers, but how are they received and, and how, how is that relationship uh, uh, done over the, over the course of the project? Yeah, I, 
I'm also going to ask Rebecca, I'll say something, but then I'd like to ask Rebecca to speak about this because uh, this was the first time we're working with hospitals and uh, we, it took a long time uh, to work out the basic understanding, the, the memorandum of understanding with the hospital. And we had to deal with the leadership in the hospital. Um, and uh, she can speak to that in a moment. In terms of dealing with the cities, um, it's not like um, dealing with a company, right? If I'm going to a private corporation, they have a CISO and they have a CEO and a COO. And if I were gonna have an agreement with them, all three of them would probably have to sign whatever the letter of agreement was. If I'm going to a, a city, a major city in, in New England, and Stephanie knows this better than I, uh, it's not clear who speaks for the city on these issues. Um, they, they have somebody who's responsible for a cybersecurity. They're not often labeled the CISO because they don't want to pay them what they'd have to pay them to be a CISO to compete with CISOs in the private sector. So it's the cybersecurity responsibility added on to the IT person's a job description. And that is the top person with regard to these issues on the technical side. Often, we have to go through somebody in the chief executive's office in addition. So we might have an agreement signed with the chief, with the chief information technology officer of the city, but it has to be countersigned by the deputy mayor or the uh, whoever's responsible for finance for the city. So they're both our client, but it's not, it's not signed by the mayor. It's not signed by the head of the city council, but it is signed by, and so when the report comes in, as you heard from Rebecca, it goes to the person that signed the memorandum of understanding. They wanna use it in many instances to get the city council or the mayor to please approve a new budget line for cybersecurity. Um, our report thus far, excuse me, thus far has been helpful in that regard. Uh, someone in another question asked, what are your measures of success? Um, if the person who hired us says, what you gave us allowed us to now begin to get the resources and to mobilize the mandate to do the specific things you said we needed to do more of, we think that's a measure of success. We can't make those things happen, but if they can use the report uh, because of, as Stephanie said, our sort of neutral or third party status, um, oh, it's not just a self-serving statement from the IT guy that he wants an assistant. Uh, it, it's it's a, a serious document uh, that says you, we've got to do more of this. You've got to get more training for your people. You've got to do a different kind of risk assessment you've got to have new backup systems and maybe they're going to be in the cloud and that's going to cost you money. And you never thought of spending that money before. And it's our report that's helping them make that case. That's our measure of success. But the, the, so far, the reaction of the people who have to make those budgetary and managerial choices has been, oh, this is a serious thing, even though it's done by a group of students in the university. Rebecca, you want to add what your experience was dealing with the hospital leadership? Sure. Um, so the hospital leadership, because of the regulation, right? So they were familiar with, we know that this area is important. Um, and they had people who were dedicated to security, but they were very, very strapped because it's a cost center, right? So you want they're not revenue generating from a from a tech standpoint they're not um you know bringing in new patients so that was something that we had to be really mindful of so we had really good um uh, like stakeholders to work with who um, we work with them on how to craft a really good assessment you know to professor suskind's point we're trying to make a case for them to get more resources to have the conversation um we did have an opportunity to speak to the CEO of the, of the hospital. Um, and once the letter of memorandum is signed, so kind of skipping the initial engagement piece though, um, they, there's some sort of, there's bias to want to help, right? Because why, why take the time to talk to people um, if you don't want to do anything in security? So you end up then kind of 
establishing um, a better relationship. And that kind of serves, at least in some cases, as additional buy-in because they're kind of aware that, oh, we've engaged this clinic. I should at least do something with, you know, the fact that we've ha like have this partnership now. Um, so that was also, um, I would say pretty interesting. Um, the other thing, and this is probably widespread, right? It's not just hospitals. I, I've worked with um, teams for municipalities as well um, th this semester in particular. Um, one thing that we do, um, which is nice and would recommend doing for you know, other clinics, whether it's cybersecurity or not, is a lot of times folks have a conversation that requires money and then look, it's like, oh, I have a solution. Can I have money for it? And the answer is no. And what we sometimes end up providing is, okay, this solution didn't work. Have you thought about X, Y, and Z? In security, it's called like a compensating control or something that it is not the best solution, but is a solution. And allowing folks to have the resources to have the conversation of alternatives has been really helpful and it helps us establish better relationships. So I think it's a really important point as well, broadly, not just for hospitals. Alberto, does that answer at least? I think so. I think so. Um, so, just just rephrasing the 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 question by Hassan as, as well. Do you have a, a specific best practice that you would that you would uh, say that it's a top one when dealing with local municipalities, and in your case, hospitals? Um, the, the, Stephanie's team and her task force have had to deal with the question of minimum necessary and best practice. Um, I, I've avoided the term best practice at every corner because in whose eyes really? Um, and, and so what we're saying is at a minimum, if you have no back, if you've not assessed what your most important data resources are and you don't know what it's gonna take to replace them if they're lost in a cyber attack, you're in a bad place and you can do better. How much of a cost benefit analysis or a risk assessment should they do of all of the potential loss of all of their different data? I can't tell them that. But what we say is, what is your most, what's gonna be the biggest problem? What's your most valuable data source? What's the hardest to recreate? Don't you think you should have a backup? What have you considered? What are the different options, as Rebecca was saying, about how to back up your most important resources? Well, you don't know what your most important resources are if you haven't answered the kind of questions we're asking of what are your greatest vulnerabilities, liabilities, and risks with regard to your data? And uh, then that we raise that in the context of insurance and we say, what, what are you gonna do if you're attacked and you're asked to pay a, a ransom? Now, most cities would say, the FBI and the National League of Cities say, don't pay ransom, you're just encouraging bad behavior. Yeah, but if, you're, if you know the story of Baltimore and they were said, we're not paying this $80,000 outrageous ransom request, fine. They lost their data of a huge portion of city financial data, it cost them $16 million to recreate those data. So should you have paid the ransom request? Maybe. Now, if you had had backup and if you had had an incident response plan and had practiced it, you might not have been attacked and you might not have had to pay the 60,000 or the $80,000. But at the point in which someone's asking, what's best practice? Should you pay ransom? All we can do is say, have you thought about what you'll do if you lose control of your data? If you haven't even thought about it and you haven't thought about what the most critical data are and what the most costly would be to recreate and you haven't considered your backup options, you're, you're, you're not prepared. Best practice, I honestly, I don't know what to say. I have lots of colleagues who offer their services when someone's attacked to negotiate with the hackers to try to reduce the ransom request. And it does turn out that you can reduce the ransom request even though you don't know who you're talking to and you can't talk to them directly. A lot of success around the world. 
negotiating with uh, ransomware attackers to reduce the amount. But is it best practice to negotiate or to have a, a, a phone number or an email address of a, of yeah. a consultant who's going to do that for you? I can't say that. So I, I, I'm, I'm sharing my anxiety about the term best practice in this context. Why, this is why I'm so attracted to what uh, Mass Cyber has done, which is say, what's at a minimum that you should be doing? And here's the tools for doing it. So what's your excuse? That is, thank you for that. Um, I think we, we've run out of the questions and I'm really thankful for, for, the, for all of your panelists and, and the great job that you're doing with this project. I would like to have a, just a final question. This one is to Stephanie um, as, 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 as a process. Um, what has been the, the, the major barrier uh, for creating this minimum baseline for cybersecurity? Because you, you, I'm sure that you're targeting public interest uh, uh, within it, but what has been the, 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 the biggest challenge of that? Uh, well, there was a lot of trying to put yourself in the shoes of a municipality and trying to figure out if I was told this is the dictate from on high, whoever that on high is, what's, re what's a reasonable expectation of an under-resourced and overworked municipality to be able to meet. And so we, the working group worked really hard to break it into just four areas because you know, there's, you could say, well, the CIS controls cover a lot of this or NIST covers that CIS controls and NIST are way above most of everyone's head at the, at the point of the people that we wanted to help. So the first step was to try to make it the minimum and make it approachable. Once we determined that that was about where we wanted to go, now it's just explaining what each of these areas are and ensuring that people understand the value of the goal and why they should make a decision as a leader in their community and a leader for their town to try to at least make the minimum in each of the four goal areas. So I think that barrier is, you know, trying to get contact, a level of trust with these communities and explain to them, this is trying to help not to you know, it's more carrot than stick. It's voluntary on your part. There are things that you can do that are free um, that just take your time that you can, you know, potentially improve your resiliency or make you at least less vulnerable than you might be today. Um, so the barrier would be, I think, communicating, establishing trust, uh, making people aware that the program even exists and why it exists. I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, Alberto, I, I know there wasn't a question about this, but I want to loop back around to the very, uh, to the point we started at and to the whole point of public interest technology, all right? I mean, we've chosen one way of working on public interest technology, and we're very thankful uh, that the foundation was willing to provide resources for us. But I, I just want to emphasize the fact that it, it's my personal belief that universities and colleges, however strained they are from all of the internal, external pressures and forces that they face, have social equity responsibilities. They have social public responsibilities. And the notion that, well, we're educating people and doing research, we're helping the world. What, what, what do you mean? We're already meeting our social responsibilities. Uh, I would say, no, those are the things you wanna do and have to do. There's other things that you ought to do to be helpful. And I would put one category of these is cities and towns around us need help. And all the people that are served by those cities and towns need help and we can contribute. There can be clinical learning opportunities along the way, but I, I really believe that public interest technology involves colleges and universities doing things that they don't all already choose to do because they want to, because it's part of their core mission but it's because they ought to do that to help places that don't, that don't have assistance. And, you know, we have the option, we can do a cybersecurity clinic and focus on corporations and ask them to pay. And we would have that money coming in and we could support students with it. But that, that seems to me 
antithetical to the idea yeah. of public interest technology. And so <laughs> thank you Larry, for that. I, thank I, you I so much. I want to underscore the, the public interest portion of what we're doing. That's all. No, no, of course. And I mean that is that is something that is part of the debates that we that we foster within the university network and and on that definition of what public interest technology is and, and where should it be focusing on. So thank you for for for, for that position on. And um, I said that that was the last one, but I really want to bring it back to, to Rebecca and Avital as a student. Um, can you give me just a little bit, and I, 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 this will be the last question. Can you give me what was your, uh, your main um, learning from working with clients outside of the university as students? Uh, what, was, what was the thing that you would, that you would um, highlight? Yeah, sure so, first. <laughs> sure. Um, so just so you know, I spent seven years in industry in the private sector. So I do work with a lot of clients. I think the difference here is that um, th one of the main sort of takeaways that I had working with clients is that um, everyone was, I guess, very friendly and very engaged and very resource strapped. And like that dynamic was something that I think was both new and important to learn, right? Because if you're gonna be sort of in a public interest field, especially if you're working in security. Um, so for me, um, like one of my main takeaways was how to be better partners with folks that you may not know very well, but you have a similar goal, right? So those communication strategies um, was really important, understanding their perspective and being very, um, differential to folks who, you know, if they've been in the same job for 30 years, right, I should be listening to them. <laughs> um, and just making sure that we are, um, you know, focusing on the partnership side of things. So um, I think those were sort of the, the highlights as, as a student, um, as opposed to a TA. Avi? Yeah, I think I'm going to echo that. I took the, when I was a student in the clinic, I was an undergrad, uh, so I was in a different position than Rebecca was. And I think it was like one of the first opportunities I had to really engage with like someone who I thought of as like an adult and someone who was like, you know, knew a lot more than me in a lot of ways, but like really engage in sort of a professional relationship where you're trying to build up that mutual partnership and really like provide a service, but at the same time, you know, really listen to what people are saying and how, you know, they came to the conclusions and they came to the state that they are in right now. And so sort of like developing those professional relationships, I think is a really good skill for students uh, to develop in general. And a, a good way of developing those is through practical, like field-based courses like the clinic. Well, I will close it off with that. Thank you, Avital, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Stephanie, John Wu. And thank you, Larry, for, for, for um, having this webinar with us. Um, this will be, again, posted on our YouTube uh, page from New America. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.